Decade. 90s was so ironic that we even had a hit song called Ironic that didn't know what the word ironic meant. That is some next level multi layered irony section. Yeah, we were jaded, we were cynical. And why? What was there to be so ironic about? We thought we were so media savvy and we could see through the messages that advertisers and marketers were trying to sell to us. And really, we were flattering ourselves. It was just a way for us to have our cake and eat it too. It's like if you can admit that you're participating in sort of an abusive and unfair system, then at least you're not oblivious. Somehow, that would make it better. But I like to think that the reason why the 90s decided to turn so ironic is because that was where we first faced the problem of the lack of a true counterculture. See, the problem with counterculture is that it is all too easily co-opted. Every genuine grassroots movement that attains a sufficient amount of momentum eventually becomes just another demographic to be marketed to. We have seen this happen with every nonconformist subculture in America in the 20th century and beyond. One band that was acutely aware of this phenomenon in the 90s was the Nation of Ulysses. Yeah, I'm still talking about bands that only I care about again this week. This one gets a little obscure because they weren't around for very long and they weren't very popular when they were around. However, they did make enough of an impact to eventually be influential. In fact, the Nation of Ulysses' main claim to notoriety is their frontman Ian Svavonius being named Sassy Magazine's Sassiest Boy in America in 1990. And if you're not familiar with Sassy Magazine, they were one of those publications for younger people that sort of tried to cater to a more alternative culture. The 90s in a nutshell, basically. The band's lineup consisted of Ian Svavonius on vocals and trumpets, Steve Croner on guitar, Steve Gamboa on bass guitar, James Canty, brother of Fugazi drummer Brendan Canty on drums, and eventually Tim Green on second guitar. Sound-wise, The Nation of Ulysses were a garage, punky, post-hardcore, noise rock type of band. Philosophically, the band's message was all over the place. They advocated rebellion for the sake of rebellion. They have songs that are about spitting out your cough medicine and eating real candy instead because it's a pale imitation of the real thing. But I have actually tried to listen to their lyrics, and if there is a coherent ideology among any of it, I can't locate it for the life of me. What was important is that they presented themselves as a radically politically charged band, even if that was a little short on the details or the specifics. And this isn't a criticism of their approach. They actually went out of their way to be indecipherable. They were more of a riff on the idea of a revolutionary punk rock band than they were the actual thing. Although they were both. They came off as sort of tongue-in-cheek because the ideas that they express and advocated in their music seemed to be concerned with overly trivial things. They were openly courting youth culture. They were speaking to a mindset that isn't really mature enough to grasp bigger picture politics yet. But they did it with conviction and they did it with passion so you could easily mistake them for the real thing if you weren't listening too closely. But what they were playing at actually worked on more than one level. When you think about revolution as far as progressivism goes, you kind of have to continue pushing the envelope. Every time you reach one goalpost of progress, there's always another one ahead that you have to continue pushing towards. The Nation of Ulysses basically pushed past all of that, to the point of absurdity, and to the point where their lyrics sort of sound like self-parody. But it was all done very intentionally and very consciously. Their first album was released on Discord Records in 1991 called 13 Point Program to Destroy America. And despite the radical, provocative title of the album, it's a lot more of a tongue-in-cheek version of those kinds of themes. A kid who tells them another kid is a dead kid. By now, kid tells another kid's a dead kid. Who tells on another kid's a dead kid. Look out, soul is back. Look out, cause soul is back, look out, cause soul is back, look out, cause soul is Today I met the girl I'm going to marry. And you're 
my Miss Washington, D.C. You're my Miss Washington, D.C. You're my Miss Washington, D.C. You're my Miss Washington, D.C. You're my Miss Washington, D.C. Well, maybe the song title that best summarizes them is The Sound of Young America. No, 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 no. It's the sound of young America. No rap in the cradle. That's the sound of young America. And the sound gets a lot more expansive and experimental on their second album from 1992 called Plays Pretty for Baby. If there was one thing that they were specifically fighting against, it's a traditional mindset, what they call parent culture. Anything that old people like is bad. Anything that young people like is good. Sound familiar? Yeah, this is the idea of a young, revolutionary-style punk band taken to a ridiculous extreme. But their sound, I think, was potent enough and provocative enough to back them up. They were one of the few independent rock groups of the time that were incorporating sounds of free jazz and fusion and the no-wave scene from the 1980s. When I refer to the Nation of Ulysses as an influential band, this is mostly the album that I'm referring to. It's songs that push the boundaries of the style that they were playing in, like Perpetual Motion Machine. Kingdom of Heaven must be taken by storm. Boys and girls, gather round! Come on, everybody! Take this sound! Lolita! 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 I'm living a house with a black guy every day! Yeah, close to my car! And the sound of jazz to come. Give me some sugar! The band's vision and philosophy extended to other materials that they would release. They had their own zine called Ulysses Speaks, where they expanded on their revolutionary ideas. And their liner notes were just full of these rambles that just went on and on and may or may not have added up to much. They were also renowned during this period for their incredibly raucous and energetic live shows, which explicitly put the band members and their audience in harm's way. Their appearance was also unusual for bands of this time. They advocated being well-dressed as a form of rebellion and wore nice suits. If you recall during this time, the fashion style was a little bit dumpy in the mainstream. So that was the mainstream version of fashionable nonconformity. This was the real thing. Rock bands probably hadn't been wearing suits since about the early 80s, and they were bringing that back despite playing a completely different sound and style. According to the liner notes for the first album, their logic behind dressing up the way they did went like this. To dress well as clothing and fashion are the only things which we, the kids, being utterly disenfranchised, have any control over. As for their music, I would say it plays a little bit similarly to their philosophies and to their lyrics, to where there are genuine moments of potent inspiration. I'm not sure any of their songs completely works for me from beginning to end, but their songs definitely have moments that stay with you, and they have ideas in them that are very interesting. And I think that was all they needed. They had a really strong gimmick and a concept going for them. I think if they had stayed together a little bit longer, then eventually they probably would have made an all-time classic record or two. But at the same time, if they had stuck around long enough to become elder statesmen of any kind, I don't think the band's concept really would have worked anymore. You can't claim to speak for the kids or to represent young people and have songs called Cool Senior High School, you know, for any of that to have any kind of impact or to mean anything, it's not really a concept or a gimmick that's built to last. So they didn't last for very long. They broke up in 1992. Its members went on to form bands like The Makeup, Weird War, Cupid Car Club, and The Fucking Champs. Other bands sort of took their idea and went a little further with it. Probably the most prominent example of that was Refused, which was a band from Sweden who released an album in 1998 called The Shape of Punk to Come which expanded on a lot of the ideas that Nation of Ulysses were espousing. The 
The difference with Refuse is that they were a lot more straight-faced about what they were doing. I think the humor and the irony of Nation of Ulysses was sort of lost on them, and they just sort of took the concept of being a revolutionary band, attached actual real-world politics to it, and took the style and aesthetic, but tried to give it a little bit more substance. And they also made it a little more metal. I think they, they incorporated other influences besides Nation of Ulysses. They weren't a straight up rip off of them, but they definitely took a lot of ideas from them. They are sort of a band in the end that I think is more interesting to talk about than they are to listen to, but I can still enjoy a lot of their songs. And I think they have a certain cleverness to them that's sort of missing from rock music ever since. Well, until next time, I'm Jacob. This was Rad 90s Music. I'll see you sometime in the future.